acutely aware that the October Revolution was the product of a particular set of circumstances, or to put that in more precise Marxist terminology, that they were the objective conditions which prevailed in Russia in the summer and the fall of 1917, by which we mean the very radical political and social decomposition that was plummeting toward chaos. It was that objective condition which was what we call the necessary cause of the October Revolution. Because certainly we know that the war had driven the Russian masses, both in the army and out of the army, to the very extremities of despair. And we know also that in viewing very blindly to that strategic line of imperialism, that the Russian bourgeoisie cut off its ties, very fragile but very indispensable ties with the popular classes. And we know that in bailing out that bourgeoisie and assuming responsibility for the bourgeois government, that the socialists who were of the moderate parties, the Mensheviks and the social revolutionaries, tended to ignore and by that to betray what were the deeply felt and deeply held aspirations of the masses, namely for peace and for land and for worker control, which were the very sine qua non of democracy in Russia in 1917. And we know finally, after all, that in taking matters into their own hands, as an insurgent peasantry and as a very angry working class began to do in the course of 1917, that they moved well beyond the frontiers of bourgeois liberalism and thereby destroyed the authority of the state. All of that we know, but it suffices to say that what we call a necessary cause is not by itself the essential or the sufficient cause. Because you see, all of those elements of decomposition added up to a very severe crisis by the fall of 1917. But those of us, after all, who have lived in a generation of all kinds of coup d'etat from the right, who have lived through events from the coup in Iran in 1953 uh, down to the coup in Chile in 1973, are perfectly aware that that kind of crisis can spawn counter-revolution just as easily, if not more easily, than it spawns revolution. And in fact, that really was the great fear that Trotsky expressed on many occasions from the earliest days of the revolution, when Trotsky began to compare the February of Petrograd of 1917 with the February of Paris of 1848. Because you recall in that February of Paris of 1848 that the bourgeoisie of France could not adapt to the demands of the working class, that they wiped that working class out in June days of 1848, that they looked for a strong military man, General Cavaignac, to try to bring an end to the revolutionary process in France, and then they looked for some kind of a Bonaparte, some kind of a dictator who should snuff out the revolution completely, and found him on the 2nd of December of 1851 in the coup d'etat of Louis Napoleon, and so Trotsky is making the comparison, and you see it literally was true that that Russian bourgeoisie not only opposed the demands of the working classes, but began to repress those workers when they manifested on the street as that repression began to become severe in July and August of 1917, and that they began to look upon Kerensky in the role of Kabeniak, that this was a strong man after all would keep order, but what they mostly wanted, what they mostly hoped for, was that military dictator, that Bonaparte, who would come to resolve, after all, that social crisis, in which they were supported up to the hilt by the Allied diplomats, those Allied diplomats who constantly were chasing that kind of wild goose of a dictator, of a military Bonaparte, to straighten Russia out, not only to keep her in the war, but but also to end the radicalization of the Russian Revolution. And remember that it is in pursuit of that dictator that the Allied governments were to invade the Soviet Union and to keep that intervention grotesquely going for more than two years. But the point is that in Russia, between September of 1917 and that 2nd of December that might have been, intervened October. 
And in that context, you can begin to understand the historic importance of Bolshevism. Because it was the Bolshevik party, after all, that provided the sufficient cause for the October Revolution, that blocked off what might have been by way of a counter-revolution, that took, after all, all of the shards, all of the pieces of that political and social decomposition and built it back into a purposive armed insurrection. And so it returns us to April of 1917, because it is in April that Lenin returns to Petrograd after almost 12 years in exile to recover his party and to impose upon that party the extraordinary strategic line of all power to the Soviets. We say to recover or restore his authority over the party. And that already tells us something interesting. That the party in Lenin's day was not that monolithic bureaucratic party that it was in Stalin's. That Lenin had tremendous moral authority in the party to be sure. But that he had to fight like hell over and again to press his point of view and did not always succeed in pressing that point of view. That after all, in that year 1917, on the very eve of the October insurrection, there were important members of the Central Committee of the Bolshevik Party, namely Zanel Zinoviev and Kamenev, who went into the non-party press and denounced Lenin's insurrectionary line. And on the morrow of that October insurrection, there were important members of the Central Committee, like Kamenev and Rykov, who denounced Lenin for rejecting a coalition government with the other socialist parties. And what better evidence of the interior debates in this Bolshevik party than the fact that at that critical moment in February and March of 1918, when Lenin is telling his party that they either have to make that separate peace with the Germans or they are finished, that they have to accept those terms or else the entire revolution will crumble and corrode, that at that very minute he went at the last minute to the Central Committee and got his line of peace with the Germans accepted only by a vote of seven to four. And consequently, you are talking about a Lenin who comes back after 12 years and is telling the Bolshevik party that they are to be the avant-garde of a revolutionary process that is to bring socialism to this backward, war-torn country. Poor Lenin. He had really taken leave of his senses. And he would face in that party a veritable wall of hostility and opposition in trying to press that point of view. Because you must remember that the February Revolution exploded in Russia at a time when most of the big leaders of Bolshevism were either in prison or in exile. That Lenin, after all, was in Switzerland, most of the others in Siberia, in Sweden, scattered around that way. So that the ones who were left on the scene in Russia were relatively younger and somehow second rank leaders, and they met that February Revolution revolution, confused, really not knowing exactly how to react to it, how to respond to that provisional government, until finally they fell back on what you would call orthodox wisdom. Now it is true that there were a couple of young left-wing elements in that party, like Shliopnikov and a young journalist for Pravda named Molotov, and their immediate response was that that provisional government was a tool of the capitalists, and that socialists had no business in supporting it, that the Petrograd Soviet ought to assume power until such time as a constituent assembly were gathered together so that it could establish the outworks of a new democratic society. But they were quickly outnumbered by the moderates and the conciliators who really controlled the party machine in Petrograd and in Moscow, and who looked upon on this as a bourgeois revolution and perforce in the control of the bourgeoisie. And consequently, that line was, let us follow the moderate socialist parties in the Soviet, let us do what they do, let us also give our support to this provisional government of the bourgeoisie, remaining in the Soviet as a kind of watchdog.
That moderate and conciliatory lie was emphasized and really pinned down when two very important Bolsheviks returned to Russia in the middle of March. I am talking about Kamenev, who is going to take over as the editor of Pravda, and his great friend at that moment, Stalin. And they arrived back in the middle of March, and both of them very strongly uh, took the position of supporting the provisional government. And consequently, you get Kamenev writing in the Pravda on the 11th of March, of this. As far as we are concerned, what matters now is not the overthrow of capitalism, but the overthrow of autocracy and feudalism. And Kamenev went even further. He said that after all, the war took on a different shape now. And here he is treading on sacred ground. Here he is beginning to defy Lenin's main, main order, which is a revolutionary struggle against the war. And Kamenev is saying, but now that we have made this February revolution, maybe we have something to defend, certainly against German imperialism, and so that article in Pravda of the 11th March continues, while the German army obeys its emperor, the Russian soldier must stand firmly at his post, answering bullet with bullet, and so you get support of the provisional government, you get the line known as defensism to defend the gains of that revolution, and you even get a certain current in favor of reunification with the Mensheviks. Uh, that comes out at the party conference at the end of March of 1917. Uh, because there it is Stalin who puts the motion. And there's nothing radical about Stalin in the constellation of these Bolshevik leaders. He puts the motion that the provisional government should be supported. Uh, but more than that, uh, that Tsaratelis demand uh, that the two parties, Bolshevik and Menshevik, be reunified or to be investigated, and that's the situation that Lenin is watching in Zurich, and he's out of his skull. <laughs> and he's sitting there in Zurich, and it's bad enough, after all, that the revolution is going on and he can't get out of that damnable Switzerland. But it's even worse, after all, that he's reading in the party press deviations of this kind, conciliatory uh, kind of defensist lines, and so he is beside himself to get back to Russia. Of course, the Allies won't let him across French terrain uh, because they say he'll go back and disrupt the war effort of their ally. Uh, the Germans don't want him going through German terrain because they'll say he'll talk to Germans and revolutionize them. And consequently, he sits there in Switzerland saying to Krupska, and his wife, I've got to think of a scheme. One day he thinks of a scheme, for example, of traveling under a bogus Swedish passport as a Swedish businessman. And in order to pretend that he can't speak, in order to disguise that he can't speak any Swedish, he'll go as a deaf mute. Kruskaya <laughs> says it won't work. You've got at least five nights on the train. You've got to sleep, and I know you. You will begin dreaming. You will see Mensheviks, and you will shrink bastard. <laughs> And finally, it's all arranged anyway, because there are negotiations with the Germans. And it is the German general staff that thinks maybe it's not such a bad idea if this disruptor goes back to Russia with some of those other anti-war Russians, and they make a deal that Lenin and 32 other Russian socialists, 18 of them Bolsheviks, can travel across German terrain to Sweden in a sealed railway car extraterritorially. They cannot talk to anybody, they can't get out, but they are dumped on Swedish terrain, and from there, Lenin will make his way by the 3rd of April to the Finland station in Petrograd and make his way back to his party. But, you see, by the time he came back, he had a position. And it was a position from the earliest days of the war, and that he had tried to bombard his party with, but they wouldn't listen. And so you get his telegram of the 6th of March of 1917 uh, to the Bolsheviks in Sweden who are going back to Petrograd, and he says, tell them this, these are my instructions. The telegram reads, our tactics, no trust in, no support of the new government.
Kerensky is especially suspect. No rapprochement with the other parties is possible, but all of that you see he spelled out in extraordinary detail, because this is really Lenin's finest moment. There is no question, but there is a veritable strategic genius at work here in those earliest days of the February Revolution. Because even before he gets back onto the scene, Lenin produces those five articles called the Five Letters from Afar, which he sends to the Bolshevik press, only the first one of which they print, but which already hammers out the strategic line that will enable the Bolshevik party to be present at the events eight months later. Because literally that strategy goes unchanged from the time Lenin hammers it out here in these letters from afar. And he begins with several of his, uh, his conclusions really are pivot around several propositions. He concludes in the first place, and very dramatically, that the bourgeois phase of the Russian Revolution is already over. It's barely begun, and Lenin is saying it is over. Or to put it more precisely, what he's saying is that the Russian bourgeoisie, as it is in this provisional government, cannot be trusted, uh, that it will always uh, back down on the demands of the people, but more than that, it will begin to make counter-revolution. He suspects it already of trying to overthrow even as much of the revolution as happened. And so in the first letter from afar, which is dated the 7th of March of 1917, he says this, For exactly precisely this new government is already bound hand and foot by imperialist capital, by the imperialist policy of war and plunder, and has already begun to strike a bargain without consulting the people with the dynasty, is working to restore the monarchy if it possibly can, or to find a Bonaparte if it cannot. So here is Lenin already saying you have basically a counter-revolutionary force there. He goes on to say that it can never really last, this government, that it is bound to collapse. The Guchkov government is held in a vase, bound by the interests of capital. It is compelled to strive to continue the predatory robber war, to protect the monstrous profits of capital and the landlords, to restore the monarchy. Bound by its revolutionary origin and by the need for an abrupt change from Tsarism to democracy, pressed by the bread-hungry and peace-hungry masses, the government is compelled to lie, to wriggle, to play for time, to proclaim and to promise, and then goes on to say that that can't last, that surely that regime is going to collapse. Now, is Lenin exaggerating? Certainly the facts bore him out that after all, that note of Milyakov on the 18th of April already opened up a crisis in which that government, that provisional government, had to give way to a coalition. It already proved that it was dealing and wheeling and plotting behind the backs of the revolution. But it's something more than that. What Lenin wasn't even on the scene to see, that from the earliest weeks of the revolution, the counter-revolution began to surface. And not only in the ranks of the bourgeoisie, but in all of those agencies of counter-revolution, among the Cossacks, among the central, uh, among the high command of the army, uh, the so-called Stavka, or the general headquarters, uh, in the Russian church, uh, certainly in certain newspapers, the Malankaya Gazeta, uh, which constantly attacked this regime. And basically, uh, what they all were looking for uh, was some strong man, ultimately, to straighten matters out. Uh, but until then, in the spring of 1917, the line was to reanimate the war, uh, to make a very big war effort, because that would strengthen the government and consequently bring prestige to the officer corps and turn all of that force against the revolution. So Lenin, in no way, exaggerating in no way off the point. And that is linked to his second conclusion, which is corollary to it, and that second conclusion is that the moderate socialists, in other words, the Mensheviks and the social revolutionaries, in supporting of this provisional government were betraying of the popular classes, uh, that they were acting really as the Girondin uh, of the Russian Revolution, uh, just as the Girondin uh, had uh, betrayed the 
a French Revolution, a so these moderate socialists would betray the workers in 1917. Uh, thereby, uh, the Bolsheviks could in no way truck with them, uh, could in no way ally with them, had to cut their, uh, divide uh, their position very sharply uh, from these moderate socialists, had to play the role of revolutionary Jacobins, if you please, against these particular Gilan uh, which leads to Lenin's most spectacular and third conclusion. And that is that the stage of the Russian Revolution is already a transitional one. Uh, that the Russian Revolution is in transition uh, from its first or liberal uh, to its second or socialist phase. And he's talking, you see, about a permanent non-stop revolution. Now, how in the world could he conceive of that? Uh, Lenin knew perfectly well uh, that the Russian working class uh, was small, uh, that the peasantry didn't have a high level of socialist consciousness at all, uh, but he based it upon the conjuncture uh, that the events of 1900 uh, made that a possibility. Uh, in the first place, uh, that the workers had at their flat a land-hungry, irrepressible peasantry. And secondly, <laughs> that there already was incubating in the furnace of the war a world revolution, and especially a revolution in those advanced capitalist societies of the West. And consequently, when he talks about this permanent revolution, uh, what he means is that the workers will be sustained at home by a peasant and that they will be sustained internationally uh, by a revolutionary proletariat in the capitalist world. <laughs> now, you know, Lenin is no adventurer, and he is no putschist, and he is a man of 47 <laughs> who has spent 30 years waiting and very lonely and in exile and certainly isn't going to fall prey to any fantasy. In fact, if anything, Lenin felt that it was very dangerous for a revolutionary party to be too far in head of the mass, too far in front, and consequently himself, in 1917 especially, played a very cautious role, perhaps too cautious, at the time of the June manifestations in 1917, perhaps too cautious at the time of July days of 1917. Certainly, I think, too cautious when he came in 1920 uh, to write that brochure, Left-Wing Communism, in which he covered some very good uh, revolutionary movements. Uh, but Lenin was very strong on that. He didn't like adventurism. He didn't like random bomb throwing. He didn't like terrorism. He was deaf on anything that looked as though it were going to move into a trap. But what really is the mainstay of Lenin, what defines him as a revolutionary, is that he defined as great a danger on the other side, uh, that the revolutionary party, soi-disant, would fall behind the mass, uh, that it would keep looking at these mass collective actions, after all, as being anarchy, as being chaos, as being somehow terrorism, and consequently to be opposed. And in that sense, he felt that, obviously, uh, the social democratic types of uh, the Mensheviks and the social revolutionaries were always wrong. You could not let the mass outstrip you. And so it was that he said at the end, at the beginning of June of 1917 to Trotsky, a very poignant thing. He said that the masses in Russia now are to the left of our left. And that was the extraordinary fact, you see. Because what Lenin had already foreseen in the earliest days, when he wrote so magnificently about what the making of that Petrograd Soviet meant, what he had foreseen in the earliest days had come to pass. That every day that was passing in Russia meant the destruction and the corrosion of the ruling class state. And it meant that day after day, the masses by themselves were beginning to arrogate all of the functions of the state to themselves. That Soviet after Soviet was following the lead, for example, of the Kronstadt Soviet and proclaiming itself quite autonomous and without any need, after all, for guidance even from the Petrograd Soviet. And so that comes to Lenin's fourth conclusion, because all of this he had noted 
or sensed in the earliest days of the revolution, that the mass would become radicalized, that that Soviet movement meant something very spectacular. And so his fourth conclusion is that from the earliest days of that February revolution, the masses have created the organ, namely the Soviets, which can guide the revolution from the first to the second stage. And thereby, the modola, or the strategy, the strategic line for the Bolsheviks, has to be down with the provisional government and all power to the Soviets. Now you see there is something fascinating about that. <laughs> Because Lenin, on the very last day that he is in Switzerland, and in the last piece that he writes from Swiss territory, which is a piece called Farewell Letter to Swiss Workers, and is dated the 26th of March of 1917, says something very extraordinary about this kind of new regime. And what he says... We need a state, but not the kind of state the bourgeoisie has created everywhere, from constitutional monarchies to the most democratic republics. And in this we differ from the opportunists and Kautskyites of the old and decaying socialist parties. We need a state, but not the kind of state the bourgeoisie needs, with organs of government in the shape of a police force, an army, and a bureaucracy separate from and opposed to the people. All bourgeois revolutions merely perfected this state machine, merely transferred it from the hands of one party to those of another. The proletariat, on the other hand, if it wants to uphold the gains of the present revolution and proceed further to win peace, bread, and freedom, must smash, to use Marx's expression, this ready-made state machine and substitute a new one for it by merging the political force the army and the bureaucracy with the entire armed people. It is Lenin talking about another kind of state, a revolutionary state, looking at the Soviet in two ways. Looking at the Soviet not only as a place in which you can mobilize workers, a place in which you can gather them in order to make an insurrection for a new society, but actually as the embryo of that new society, as the place in which the working classes will be able to administer and to govern themselves. Now you see there is something very important behind this. And that is that even before the February Revolution, Lenin had begun to restudy and rethink the problem of the state. It is not something to which he had given very sophisticated attention. There weren't many texts of Lenin on what the dictatorship of a proletariat or a revolution Revolutionary dictatorship is. But he began late in 1916 to make this investigation. And he did so to a great extent under the impetus of articles being written by a brilliant young comrade of his, a young Bolshevik called Nikolai Bukharin. And Bukharin, in 1916, had written a celebrated essay, or what has come to be celebrated, called toward a theory of the imperialist state. And in that, Bukharin had said that orthodox Marxists, like Kautsky and so forth, had really misinterpreted what Marx meant by a revolutionary state. Uh, they had made him out to be a statist, as someone who thought that the revolution simply was transferring the bourgeois state into the hands of a socialist party. But no, says Bukharin, he was an anti-statist. He was somebody who believed that you had to smash uh, that bourgeois state and really devolve power into the hands of the populace in whole, wholly other ways. That that, after all, was the message that he was giving in his brochure on the commune called The Civil War in France, when he wrote, the working class cannot simply lay hold of the ready-made state machinery and use it or mold it for its own purposes. That what you will do, you see, will simply be to recreate all of the social relationships, all of the institutions of the old society if you take over that bureaucratic
Soviet parliamentary machine, as the Kautskys and those orthodox Marxists were saying. That article impressed Lenin, and consequently he went off in his own study, a reading the texts of Marx and Engels very carefully, a reading the debate between Ponikek and Kautsky in 1911 and 12, uh, the fruits of all of that research, of course, would culminate in his famous brochure, State and Revolution, uh, which he would write in August of 1917 and publish in September of that year. But even before he went back to Russia, he put in his notebooks for the first week of March of 1917 this conclusion about his studies. The fundamental idea of Marx, the conquest of political power by the proletariat, is not the seizure of a state machine already established, but its demolition. We can express all that very concretely, replacement of the old statist and parliamentary machinery by subjects of workers' deputies. You see the point. The point is that by the time Lenin went back to Russia in April of 1917, he had defined the second revolution both strategically and conceptually. Strategically, he had defined it as the revolution that would be made by passing power to the Soviets. Conceptually, he defined it as that revolution which would devolve power, the power to administer, the power to govern upon the masses themselves through their particular Soviets. And with that particular instrument, he went back to Russia. Now you know that the Lenin who went back to Russia in April of 1917 was no ordinary military. This was an extraordinary character from the point of view of commitment, from the point of view of single-mindedness. He reminds one very much of that model of the revolutionary that is carved by Bakunin and by Nechaya in their famous revolutionary catechism in which they write about the revolutionary, everything in him is absorbed by a single exclusive interest, a single thought, a single passion, the revolution. Now I mention that so that you can get something of the irony of the scene when Lenin comes back at the Finland station on the 3rd of April of 1917. The cause, the Soviet, led by the Mensheviks and social revolutionaries, not so very keen about Lenin coming back, a bit frightened, but they thought that they would con him. They thought they would win him over. You make a big celebration. There was the Bolshevik delegation with flowers which they thrust into Lenin's hand. Lenin with flowers is very odd. And then, of course, there was the delegation of the Soviet, headed by Kuchensky, who was the president of the, of the Soviet, and they were going to tell Lenin, look, we are all working together. You have been out of the country. You don't know what harmony there is. Bolsheviks, Mensheviks, we're all supporting this provisional government, and consequently, we're even supporting the war because we have so many games, after all, to protect. And then they brought some workers and soldiers and sailors to give it a nice proletarian decor. Now, Sukhanov was there. And Sukhanov, who was a terrific gossip and looked at everything, has written the description of that return of Lenin to the uh, Finland station. And it goes like this. Lenin came, or rather ran, into the room. He wore a round cap, his face looked frozen, and there was a magnificent bouquet hanging from his hands. <laughs> Running to the middle of the room, he stopped in front of Chehezge, as though colliding with a completely unexpected obstacle. And Chehezge, president of the Soviet, still glum, pronounced the following speech of welcome. Comrade Lenin, in the name of the Petersburg Soviet and the whole revolution, we welcome you to Russia. But we think that the principal task of the revolutionary democracy is now the defense of the revolution from any encroachment, either from within or from without. We consider that what this goal requires is not disunion, but closing of the democratic rights, and we hope that you will pursue these goals together with us. Lenin plainly knew exactly how to behave. He stood there as though nothing taking place had the slightest connection with him. 
looking about him, examining the persons round him, and even the ceiling of the imperial waiting room, adjusting his bouquet, and then turning directly away from the executive committee delegation altogether, he made his reply but to the workers and the sailors on the other side of the room. Dear comrades, soldiers, sailors, and workers, I am happy to greet in you in your persons the victorious Russian Revolution and greet you as the vanguard of the worldwide proletarian army. The piratical imperialist war is the beginning of civil war throughout Europe. The hour is not far distant when at the call of our comrade, Karl Liebknecht, the peoples will turn their arms against their own capitalist exploiters. Any day now, the whole of European capitalism will crash. The Russian revolution accomplished by you has prepared the way and opened a new epoch. Long live the worldwide socialist revolution. And so Suhanov comments, suddenly before the eyes of all of us, completely swallowed up by the routine drudgery of the revolution, there was presented a bright, blinding, exotic beacon obliterating everything we live by. Lenin's voice, heard straight from the train, was a voice from outside. There had broken in upon us the revolution, a note that was not, to be sure, a contradiction, but that was novel, harsh, and deafening. And so Lenin went to work, and not surprising that he went to work on his own part. And you must understand that Lenin is not genial, he's not a genial type at all. And consequently, when he goes to his party, he's very abrasive, but he goes as an equal. He goes to meeting after meeting to convert people, and consequently, gradually begins to convert on the basis of the famous April Theses. Now, the April Theses were the article that Lenin wrote and were published in the Prague on the 7th of April of 1917. And when Kamenev published the April Theses, he had prefaced them by saying, this is only Lenin's opinion, and we know he's wrong, uh, that the bourgeois stage is not over, but since he's Lenin, we let him print this. And he printed the, uh, the April Theses and fought for them, and they're worth reading, or at least in part, because they set the strategic line once and for all extremely well. Point one, in our attitude toward the war, which under the new government of Lvov and company unquestionably remains on Russia's part a predatory imperialist war owing to the capitalist nature of that government, not the slightest concession to revolutionary defensism is possible. In other words, all-out struggle against the war. Secondly, the point of transition. The specific feature of the present situation in Russia is that the country is passing from the first stage of the revolution to its second stage, which must place power in the hands of the proletariat and the poorest sections of the peasants. Uh, this transition is characterized on the one hand uh, by a maximum of legally recognized rights. Russia is now the freest of all the belligerent countries in the world. On the other, by the absence of violence toward the masses. In other words, that you can carry on this transition because there is this period of freedom, and that's what Lenin backed upon a great deal, uh, that the Bolsheviks would be able to make great headway among the masses because they would not be repressed that this freedom did exist at this particular moment. A point three, no support for the provisional government, the utter falsity of all of its promises, etc. Point four, extremely important. Recognition of the fact that in most of the Soviets of workers' deputies, our party is still in a minority, so far a small minority, as against a block of all petty bourgeois <coughs> opportunist elements, from the popular socialists and the socialist revolutionaries down. Now, the masses must be made to see that the Soviets of workers' deputies are the only possible form of revolutionary government. In other words, the task of the Bolsheviks, uh, they have this freedom, they are a minority, their task is to go to the masses, to follow the mass line, as it were, uh, to uh, uh, respond to the demands, the aspirations that they find, and consequently to convert, to win over, and thereby to become the majority in the Soviets. Number five, not a parliament republic. To return to a parliamentary republic from the Soviets of workers' deputies would be a retrograde step. So that it will be a Soviet stage, abolition of the police, of the army and the bureaucracy, of the salaries of all officials, of whom are, uh, of, uh, all of whom are elective and displaceable at any time, not to exceed the average wage of a competent worker. Uh, point six, and this on the peasant. 
on the weight of emphasis in the agrarian program to be shifted to the Soviets of agricultural laborers, confiscation of all land in the states, nationalization of all land in the country, the land to be disposed of by the local peasant Soviets. So you see the point, what Lenin is saying is three things. Uh, what he's saying is that the masses are going to become more radicalized. He's saying in the second place that the Bolsheviks, in going to them, will win them over to Bolshevism, and then the Bolsheviks will be a majority of the Soviets. To pass all power to the Soviets in that sense is to make a peaceful socialist revolution. So with that line that Lenin went, meeting after meeting, finally got to convert some of the big ones, converted Stalin, converted Bukharin, converted Zinovia, never did convert Kamen or Rykov, and finally got to the big Bolshevik conference between the 24th and the 29th of April of 1917, the famous April conference. And at this conference, Lenin had the context that he needed, uh, because this was right after the Milyakov note, right after the masses had rioted on the streets when the provisional government was in full crisis, Lenin could go to that April conference and he could say, you see, this government does not have lasting power. The masses are getting more radical. The point is clear. The point is that Lenin wins. At the April conference of 1917, they adopt for the most part his line that this is a transition to a second stage, that all power to the Soviets must be the line of the whole of a party, and with that, he sets that party out on its historic course. All of which raises a parenthesis that really must be raised. And that is that what did Lenin really mean by all power to the Soviets? And what did he mean when he said it was going to be a Soviet democracy and not a parliamentary democracy? You see, the question is a very important one. Because if Lenin is looking at the Soviets as a way in which the Bolsheviks can get a majority and consequently rise to power that way, then it is the party and the state machine that the party constructs which still dominates that society. If, on the other hand, he is really thinking about the Soviets as the organs of a new society, as a way in which human beings will relate to each other in a different way, then that's a cultural and a political revolution of the first order. Now the question is to be raised for two reasons. One, because you get very good critics, for example, like Martin Buber, in that book of his Paths and Utopia, who said that to Lenin, after all, the Soviets were never involved in what you would call a structural problem. In other words, words, Lenin wasn't thinking about the structure of society. They were involved in a strategic problem. How you get to power? What is the instrument through which you go to power? And the other thing that has to be noted is that the Soviets do become devitalized. They are clipped in the very earliest stages of the Bolshevik regime after the revolution. That they become bureaucratized and then they become very quickly subordinated to state institutions. And so the question is a fundamental one. It is, what is Leninism? And what is the relationship of Leninism if there is a relationship to Marx? What is the relationship of Leninism to Stalin on the other side? And what happens out of this definition that begins to affect the very nature and the shape of Soviet society, the nature and shape of what we call socialism for so very long a period of time? Well, look, there is a basic text, is there not? The basic text is state and revolution. If I have read state and revolution once, I have read it 60 times. And I have looked at that book over and again until I have come to the conclusion that state and revolution has a very different tone and a very different message from Marx's civil war in France with which it is very frequently compared. That Marx, after all, had at the center of his thinking about a socialist society the conception of association, 
The word association is very central to Marx. It's no accident that when Marx helps to found the first international, it is called the association of working men. That in a book, for example, like The Poverty of Philosophy, when he describes strikes, he says a strike is not important in terms of what kind of gain is made. It is important in terms of association. And why? What does association mean in Marx's terms? It means, first of all, an end to all competition among working men and women. It means an end to that division of labor. It means an end to all of those institutions institutions that come like the family and the marriage and sexual codes and schools, all the institutions of society that come to separate human beings from each other. When Marx talks about association, he is talking about a cultural revolution, about a tabula rasa in which you begin again and in which there is no wage labor, that the whole idea is to end wage labor. That is the whole idea of socialism. But you see, you do not have that idea of association in Lenin. That for Lenin, after all, the purpose of socialist building was to create those outworks of that society, those material products which would enable that standard of living, which would enable those exploited masses finally to live decently, and consequently the emphasis or the stress upon taking over, if you please, that huge productive machine of monopoly capitalism and using it for the productive ends of socialism, that, after all, was very strong and almost most uppermost in Lenin's mind, and consequently you do not find in state and revolution any place that kind of statement that in the new society there will be an end to the wage structure itself. You do not find in that most libertarian tract the idea that there will be an end to state authority <coughs> by itself. You have, on the contrary, statements that really indicate what we are talking about. We, the workers, shall organize large-scale production on the basis of what capitalism has already created. Now, you see, that is not in Marx's The Civil War in France. When he is talking about the commune as a wholly new experience, he's talking about smashing not only the state in its formal sense, but all of the modalities of the state. The wage relationship, that huge constellation of monopoly capitalism, that large-scale production. Lenin goes on to say, accounting and control, that is mainly what is needed for the smooth working, for the proper functioning of the first phase of communist society. All citizens are transformed into hired employees of the state, which consists of the armed workers. All citizens become employees and workers of a single countrywide state syndicate. All that is required is that they should work equally, do their proper share of work, and get equal pay. Now that's all well and good. That is a mode, that is a style. Lenin, who I deem to be the greatest revolutionary strategist of the 20th century, the man who really put it through at very crucial moments, in my judgment, did not have in terms of what he wrote about the Soviet, in what he thought about it, had no such idea as you find embedded in Marx of what a genuine cultural revolution is all about. And I make no connection between Lenin and the one that came after. <laughs> but that is missing. Or I'm quite missing at any rate in one. But what I do not find missing is a capacity to understand how things corroded. And consequently, the six weeks after he took over his party at the April conference, there was constant evidence that Lenin had really set the party on the right revolutionary course. Because at every turn, well, there are workers and there are peasants who are increasing their demands, who are intensifying the class struggle, who are taking matters into their own hands, and the provisional government at every turn is responding that it cannot meet those demands. Even the executive of the Petrograd Soviet, becoming increasingly conservative, is saying that all of this agitation is the work of 
Bolsheviks and anarchists and so forth. And consequently, at every point, they are the Bolsheviks who will pick up the discontented public. Look, and at a certain point, and for reasons that are perfectly clear, I'm getting a little anxious and so forth. <laughs> So much to say. I mean, we're still only in April. <laughs> I'll get to October before I finish. Uh, you know, it's really interesting from here on. Uh, it shouldn't surprise us that there comes an intervention, for example, by the oppressed nations of Russia. Because you know that the Tsarist state, after all, and in fact the state that succeeded it, was a vehicle of interior and internal oppression. An interior, a, a vehicle of internal imperialism and that the state had been put together by the conquests of people who were simply oppressed minorities or who were oppressed nations that no longer had a culture, no longer had an economy, no longer had a politics of their own. Uh, we're talking not only about those Westerners whom you know, about Poles and about Finns and Estonians and Latvians and Lithuanians and Ukrainians and Armenians and Georgians but we're talking about that vast array, for example, of Islamic tribes that stretched across Central Asia uh, from the eastern shore of the Caspian Sea all the way to the western frontier of China in that huge expanse uh, that is simply referred to as Turkestan. And you get all of those people very bitterly exploited. And none more exploited, certainly, uh, than the peasantry and the nomadic tribes uh, of Central Asia and of the Caucasian areas. Uh, because there are people who saw their lands ripped away from them, uh, who saw their their culture very frequently destroyed by programs of Russification, who had very heavy taxes imposed upon their peasant masses, and who in the final analysis had their domestic economies ruined by the intrusion of Russian capitalism. So it shouldn't surprise us that within the ambit of the February Revolution, there are national liberation and national autonomy movements that begin to germinate within Russia. And that is a terribly important in fact, uh, because those revolutions will begin to open up an entire new way of developing Asia. And so you get, for example, uh, in uh, the period of, uh, of March and of April, uh, literally scores of mini congresses held among Islamic peoples. And the auspices of these movements, of course, are very mixed. Uh, sometimes they're very reactionary. Uh, there are emirs or there are Islamic priests who want to go back to a certain traditionalism. Uh, sometimes there are nascent bourgeoisie, uh, that uh, the middlemen between the Russians and the peasantry who want the markets for themselves. But occasionally, they are also a revolutionary intelligentsia, uh, fighting both against feudalism and against the bourgeoisie. The point is that all of this explodes or culminates on the 11th of May of 1917 in a terrific congress of Islamic peoples that is held in Petrograd with nine delegates. And there is a Bureau of Twelve, and on that Bureau of Twelve is a woman named Salima Yakabova, who is the first Islamic woman ever to preside over a Congress in modern times, and who becomes something of a spokeswoman for that kind of liberation which hadn't been heard of in that part of the world. In fact, that's fascinating, because at that Congress, if you want to know something about the history and the very difficult struggle of women's liberation, at that particular Islamic Congress of May of 1917, uh, the big controversy uh, was whether the priests who were the delegates there would permit women to participate. And the women got in, uh, the priests were outvoted, and not only did they get in, but they pushed through a resolution for the complete equality of rights uh, between Islamic men and women, including political rights, and for an end to the veil, and for an end to polygamy, and for free choice in marriage, what I'm saying is that here in May of 1917, you get the first imported women's liberation document in the Asiatic world. Now, the point is that the provisional government and the moderate socialist parties couldn't do anything about that. They couldn't meet the needs of national liberation movements. The bourgeoisie wouldn't because imperialism was its business. But Lenin was able to meet those needs. Because Lenin on this question is extraordinary. 
of all European socialists. He was the one who was sensitive to the revolutionary force of national liberation movements. And he fought against Rosa Luxemburg, against Karl Radek, against Bukharin himself on that particular question. And it's on two grounds, of course. It's on the ground in the first place, on the ground in the first place that he's opposed to racism. That after all, if you oppress these national minorities, what you are doing is accommodating the working classes to a kind of racism. The proletariat, he writes in 1916, cannot remain silent on the question of frontiers of a state founded on national oppression, a question so unpleasant for the imperialist bourgeoisie. The proletariat must struggle against the enforced retention of oppressed nations within the bounds of the given state. The proletariat must demand freedom of political separation for the colonies and nations oppressed by their own nation. Otherwise, the internationalism of the proletariat would be nothing Nothing but empty words. You see what he's saying, what Marx said, that no nation can be free so long as it oppresses other people. But the second thing is that Lenin, despite the arguments of a Rosa Luxemburg or a Rodin, that if you support these national liberation movements, you may support reactionary movements, and that they may be traditionalists, and they may be bourgeois, who will take over and will deliver the masses to them. What Lenin insists upon is that there, that is the character that their nation is the cadre within which they must struggle. That once they are not oppressed by another nation, then the class struggle, after all, or will simply resume itself with that nation. And so Lenin is there with that kind of doctrine uh, which he imposes upon his party. And I just want you to think in your imaginings what it was like uh, when, after all, the Bolsheviks took over in uh, October of 1917, and almost at once, Lenin issued this this manifesto uh, to the toiling Muslims in Russia and the Far East. Henceforth, your faith and customs, your national cultural institutions are proclaimed free and inviolable. Build your national life uh, uh, freely and unhindered. This is your right. Be it known to you uh, that your rights, like the rights of all nationalities of Russia, are protected by the full might of the revolution and its organ. Imagine what that meant to those intellectuals, especially in the colonized world, that here was a government saying you have a right to all of your autonomy, you have a right to all of your custom, to all of your freedom. It will play its day, it will play its part. But you see, at every point, there is no response from government. And consequently, as you approach the summer of 1917, you're beginning to get tremendous upset, and you're getting a, a kind of a repressive response by the government, that if you can only seal uh, the lips of these Bolsheviks, if you can only tie down the anarchists, uh, there will be no agitation, and the two shocks of recognition come in June and July. In June, it's famous June manifest, uh, the June manifest, manifestations. Uh, the June manifestations of, of the 18th of June, uh, which indicate that the Bolsheviks have such a very heavy control uh, over the working class of Petrograd. In July, it's the effort to repress the Bolshevik party uh, without success. Just very briefly, oh, it's five minutes more. <laughs> are you really, are you really very fatigued? Because I don't want to you're imagining things. Huh? What? I have another clip. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. I didn't come here. Uh, except when I want to. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happened, you see, uh, in June, uh, there are uh, part, of, part of the troops in the Petrograd barracks uh, had gone Bolshevik. Uh, there was a desire in the very first week of June to have some kind of a demonstration against the war, because after all, there was the Kerensky plan, again, to have a big offensive, uh, again, to push Russia onto the Eastern Front, and so the troops were beginning to protest against that. The Bolshevik Party, the Central Committee, Lenin, thought about that, and they thought, well, not a demonstration just on that particular score, but a big popular demonstration uh, for the 10th of June, uh, with the slogans of down with the provisional government, all power to the Soviets, uh, down with the imperialist war, uh, in other words, to make a real popular test of Bolshevik strength. And consequently, uh, the call for this demonstration uh, comes on the 9th of June in Prague, 
thereafter, and immediately the executive committee of the Soviet uh, decides that they cannot have it. And what they do is to clamp down and to say that for three days uh, there will be no demonstrations on the street at all. Uh, Lenin, for a moment, uh, thinks that he ought to fight back, but Lenin is no adventurer in that regard. And the All-Russian Congress of Soviets, the first All-Russian Congress, was meeting, uh, supported the executive committee of the Petrograd Soviet, and consequently Lenin decided that a confrontation really wasn't a very good idea, and the Bolsheviks backed down. Uh, but the Soviet had to send emissaries into the factories, into the industrial districts, uh, into the army barracks, to persuade the people not to come out on the streets on the 10th. And they got there, and the workers and the soldiers were enraged. And they hissed them, and they booed them, and they called them the bloodsuckers of capitalists, and so forth. And consequently, uh, the emissaries went back, knowing full well what the temper of the crowd was. But the next day, uh, the streets were empty. And so the Soviet felt that it had scored a victory, and it could follow up that victory by having its own demonstration on the 18th of June. A demonstration in which the slogan would be, support for the provisional government, support for the Petrograd Soviet. And consequently, they thought that they would test their strength, that they had it clear over the Bolsheviks, and that was that famous Sunday on the 18th of June of 1917, because uh, the people did come out. Uh, they came out by the scores of thousands, about a half million, but they came out, those wretched workers, with all of the slogans of the Bolsheviks. And they shouted, down with the, so down with the uh, provisional government, all power to the Soviets, down with the war, down with the Petrograd Soviet, and consequently, it all boomeranged to such a point that Gorky, who was then still not a Bolshevik, would write in Novaya Zhin, which was his newspaper, the Sunday demonstration revealed the complete triumph of Bolshevism over the Petrograd workers. And consequently, this was at the heart of Lenin's strategy. At the end of June, he still thought it was possible to go peacefully to power, uh, that the Bolsheviks would simply become majorities in the Soviets, and they would pass to that second stage of that socialist stage. And of course, not that he was opposed to violence, he simply thought the circumstances in Russia in 1917 made that peculiar possibility a very real one, all of which collapsed in July, because on July 3rd and 4th come famous July days, after which there is a terrific repression. Uh, July days, uh, the context obviously, uh, the crushing defeat uh, that the Russians suffered uh, at the hands of the German armies in Kerensky's offensive. Uh, the 2nd of July, in fact, Hindenburg begins a counteroffensive which really simply knocks the Russian army out of the war. Uh, in the second place, terrific economic crisis, uh, 35,000 workers in the Putovov arms works uh, are out on strike by the 1st of July, and then terrific agitation and Kronstadt. Uh, the Kronstadt sailors up in riots because the government has been disciplining uh, their anarchist militants and consequently uh, there is an aura of real rioting when on the 2nd of July the cadet ministers, uh, the five cadet ministers uh, resign. And they resign over the Ukrainian issue. They want no autonomous rights for the Ukraine. They resign. The cry goes up. All right, this is time to have uh, simply an all-socialist provisional government or pass power to the Soviets. This was really the critical moment. The socialists who were left in that provisional government said, no, uh, we will continue with our class alliance. Uh, that is the stage to which we have arrived at. And consequently, great riots exist on the 3rd and the 4th of July. Well, the Bolsheviks did not lead those riots. The Bolsheviks were opposed to them, very timid and cautious about this, thinking that it might really be a trap, and nonetheless they happened. The Bolsheviks went out on the street once they happened, but in the final analysis, all of this rioting for a two-day period ended when the Petrograd Soviet counted on enough loyal troops in order to clear the streets. Uh, the result of those July days was very important, uh, which is that, uh, first of all, there was a shakeup in the government. Uh, Kerensky becomes a virtual dictator. But more than that, 
Uh, it was a terrific repression uh, leveled against the Bolsheviks. Uh, they were now accused of being German agents, uh, that they had tried to foment these riots in order to coordinate with Hindenburg's offensive. Uh, top Bolsheviks are arrested. Uh, Lenin has to go into hiding. Uh, finally ends up in Finland, uh, where he remains until virtually the eve of the October Revolution. All of this designed to crush the Bolshevik movement. But it boomerangs. It boomerangs because it brings the Bolshevik support. It is then, for example, that that interborough organization to which Trotsky belongs. Trotsky was not a Bolshevik. And it's only in July of 1917 that he brings his little organization of 3,000 with people like Jaffa and like Lucharsky over to the Bolsheviks. Terrific, terrific asset to Lenin. Uh, Trotsky really an orator in the tripe, uh, somebody who was a tremendous agitator and somebody who could add a real counterweight to the conciliatory types like Rykov in the Central Committee. It's a time when the left social revolutionaries, uh, people like Nat and Son, come over to the Bolsheviks. But more than that, uh, the post-July Day move on the part of the ruling class was a counter-revolutionary move. And consequently, they tried to pull off a counter-revolution, the famous Kornilov putsch uh, in the end of August of 1917. Uh, Kornilov was a general. Uh, he had actually been named uh, as the chief of the Russian armies by Kerensky with the idea that he could keep an eye on him. Uh, well, Kornilov, of course, uh, whom Alexeyev said had the heart of a lion and the head of a sheep, uh, Kornilov uh, was, of course, always flattered uh, by the counter-revolutionary forces inside. He would be the bone apart, and consequently, uh, he was uh, to be dismissed uh, by Kerensky on the 26th of August. Kerensky said, you're plotting, and you are finished. Uh, I remove you from command. At that point, Kornilov took his army and marched on Petrograd. But the point is that the defense of Petrograd, uh, which didn't take very much defense, because as soon as the troops got there, they fraternized with the workers anyway, but the defense was in a committee against counter-revolution, and that was a Bolshevik committee. They armed the workers. They defended the city. You see the point? The point is that the counter-revolution gets discredited, uh, the government gets discredited, the only group that comes out with credit uh, by September of 1917 are the Bolsheviks. So you see, it starts with the original thing. That it all comes out that the necessary cause are the events of 1917 and the conditions of 1917, but that's not sufficient. <coughs> that's the point. The sufficient cause was the presence of that party that went in May in 1917. called Lenin indispensable to the success of the October insurrection. And so I cite from Trotsky's history of the Russian Revolution a kind of an astonishing uh, uh, intervention, a kind of an astonishing insight from the point of view of how much he underscored the role of an individual, the role in a sense of a hero in this revolutionary process. And so Trotsky writes, certainly Lenin didn't create the revolutionary situation, nor could he have done without it. And yet, Lenin knew how to exploit those objective conditions to the account of the proletariat. Uh, the victory of the Russian working class was possible in 1917, but only if a party existed which could mastermind it. In fact, the Bolshevik party couldn't fill that role until its militants understood it. And for that, Lenin was indispensable. Until his arrival in April of 1917, not a single one of the top Bolshevik leaders had properly diagnosed the course of the revolution. Uh, the team of Kamenev and Stalin had pushed the party toward the right, even entertaining the idea of reunification with the Mensheviks. Lenin's arrival burst open a crisis in the party and turned it around. Are we to assume, by some standard of blind determinism, that the party would inevitably have done that anyway? We can in no way be sure of that. 
Time was a decisive factor. It was a race to the crossing between a right-wing coup and a political revolution of the left. In those circumstances, the party could easily have delayed too long. It could have let the opportunity slip by for years to come. Now, in my view, Trotsky's judgment is perfectly and eminently sound. But you see, we have no purpose, really, in enshrining Lenin, nor do we have any interest precisely in that kind of nostalgia that lingers upon past heroes and upon past heroics. I personally have a very strong ascetic objection uh, to the kind of sentimentalism that very frequently affects uh, the left and very frequently infects left-wing militants. Uh, that kind of sentimentalism which really dulls the cutting edge and which most essentially cloaks militants very frequently in the false comfort of looking back at the past and not recognizing the particular tasks of the present. It's the kind of nostalgia and sentimentalism that was once lampooned, you know, by Tom Lair in a magnificent line in a song when talking about the Spanish Civil War. He said, you know, we had all the best songs and they won all the battles. Well, quite obviously, you can't simply linger upon the six songs for democracy, uh, but you have to confront the problems of defeat, uh, the problems of what went wrong, and consequently, it is in no way uh, to enshrine Lenin that I cite that particular text. Rather, it is to try to excavate, if you please, certain of the unspoken implications of that particular quotation, or more precisely, to try to formulate certain propositions about the Leninist project, which which, in touching upon the modalities and the strategy of social change, really concern us and touch on the most intimate parts of our political existence. That in the first place, and as a primary proposition, Lenin, more than any other militant of his era, understood what the primal importance was of building a revolutionary party and of adapting that party through all of the conjunctures and all of the convolutions of history, adapting that party to fast-changing events, adapting its structure and adapting its tactics. And that point is perfectly primordial, because in the entire Leninist project, there is nothing so important as that. The need for a party which is very clear-eyed about events as they pass, and which is armed with a strategy to exploit those events, to act as a mediator uh, between the masses, whose consciousness is always imperfect, whose consciousness always fluctuates, and a gathering social crisis. And it is precisely to that point that George Lukács was to speak so eloquently in a series of articles that he was to write in 1924, that great and eminent Hungarian Marxist philosopher, a series of articles which are gathered together in a little book called Lenin. And he describes in that little book what the Leninist idea of the party is and how Lenin left a legacy in that Bolshevik party of 1917, which is a very enduring lesson for revolutionary movements that come afterwards. And this is what we find in Lukács' text on Lenin. The party must, on the one hand, have theoretical clarity and the toughness necessary to follow the right course, regardless of the irresolution of the masses and their sudden flip-flops, even at the risk, at moments, of seeming isolated from those masses. But on the other hand, it should remain flexible and receptive enough to learn lessons from every manifestation of the masses, from their every collective action, which reveal revolutionary possibilities which they themselves cannot see. And you have a feeling that Lukács is thinking of that Leninist contribution from April of 1917, when he came back to Russia and saw in that vast energy that the mass was manifesting in forming those Soviets, a revolutionary potential which enabled him to say, even though others were not saying it, all power to the Soviets and let us pass to the second stage of the revolution. Because Lukács goes on to make this conclusion. If the party isn't capable of incessantly adapting its theoretical understanding to the ever-fluctuating course of events, it falls behind the times 
from the avant-garde, it becomes the rear guard, and it loses contact with the masses. In other words, a party which, even if it's used to its line, over and against the lack of comprehension of the populace itself and of the popular classes, nonetheless learns at every moment from the potentialities that those masses themselves create by their intervention into the course of history. And so you come to a second proposition, which really is a corollary of the first. And that is that Lenin, really almost more than any militant of his time, managed to reunite theory and practice, managed in a sense to make that interaction of theory and practice work, which had been so badly severed by the so-called orthodox Marxists of the Second International, who had abstracted theory from life, abstracted, if you please, from that kind of revolutionary practice, which is so important in refurbishing any kind of theory. You see, we're talking about the Lenin now, who in the course of his own struggle with militants in the Bolshevik party, who were hewing to orthodox positions, to the theory of historical development, to the stages of historical development, very frequently cited a text or an observation of Gauta, and used this observation over and again in his debates and in his polemics. And the observation was that theory is gray, but the tree of life is green. In other words, that theory itself really is gray because it doesn't get out into the life of practice, into the very sunlight of revolutionary intervention, of revolutionary action. And it's only if it does, after all, that it begins to reflect or represent something very real. Or we're talking about the Lenin who refused to be hamstrung by that theory of historical stages, a theory, after all, which Marx had developed in order to give some understanding of the past and some comprehension of the present, but who never thought of that theory as an axiom or a shibboleth uh, to be applied at every moment in every possible or conceivable context. And we're thinking about that Lenin who fought every convolution in the course of events, who hawked, after all, everything that was happening in order to put his finger on those revolutionary possibilities which no militant worth his salt ever could let pass by. And we're thinking about that Lenin, who in the very marrow of his bone understood that Marxism, after all, was deformed by abstract theory, and that theory took on life only when it was connected to practice. And that's why you have the Lenin, for example, who could look at those Soviets in 1917 and understand that they reflected an upsurge of mass energy and mass creativity, which could be the real propelling force from one stage of a revolution to another. And the Lenin, who was the only militant who was willing to set against the opposition of Rosa Luxemburg, against the opposition of Radek or of Bukhara, who was willing to say that there was real revolutionary force in national liberation movements, who committed his own Bolshevik party to the position of self-determination for oppressed nations, a self-determination very different from Wilson's conception of self-determination, because in Lenin's lexicon, it meant, after all, a throwing off of the colonial yoke, a throwing off of colonial oppression. It meant, in terms of the oppressed nations of Russia, who constituted, after all, a majority of the population living within the Tsarist Empire, it meant for them the right of cultural and political autonomy, or, if they chose, the right actually to secede politically from that Tsarist Empire. And what it did was to ally Bolshevism to the potential revolutionary force of the Third World Revolution, and that alliance was not broken literally for decades. What gave communism force, literally, in that third world was that so early recognition of that right of self-determination, of that revolutionary potential of these national liberation movements. And so once again, it is Lukács who puts his finger on this major accomplishment of Lenin, on this kind of fusion of theory and practice, because what he writes in that little book called Lenin, 
it is the essence of history constantly to produce the new. And no theory is infallible enough to encompass all that newness in advance. Thus, the revolutionary party isn't supposed to impose a strategy of action on the masses, which has been worked out abstractly and for all time. It is supposed to work constantly from the struggles of the masses and their endlessly inventive methods of struggle. The organization should change and adapt as those struggles develop. For dogmatism in theory and sclerosis in organization are fatal to the party. And then Lukács makes a concluding sentence and he must have in mind the way in which that Bolshevik party really did adapt in 1917. How it was a party of 23,000 on the eve of the February Revolution and was a party already of 200,000 at the end of July of 1917, a party that opened its way and opened its doors as the consciousness of the mass deepened and as its class struggle really came to a point of no return. And so Lukács concludes in a magnificent sentence, Lenin's conception of the party is the sharpest break with the mechanistic and fatalistic version of Marxism, that a party will simply inherit the world as capitalism inevitably collapses. It is the practical realization of Marx's revolutionary insight, his 11th thesis on Feuerbach, that philosophers have interpreted the world in many ways, but the point is to change it. And consequently, you have a Lenin who, in that fusion or interaction of theory and practice, is perfectly willing to scrap the axiom or scrap the, the shibboleth as the events, after all, occur which permit it. And that, of course, leads to our third proposition, which is the most precise. And that is that Lenin had the capacity to adapt his party to its essential, indispensable, and irreducible function. That is, to prepare and to orchestrate the socialist revolution. There is no other imprescriptible function for a socialist party but that, and Lenin knew it. Now, we've already described the way in which Lenin returned in April of 1917 and told his party that you have no business supporting bourgeois democracy, that that is finished, that you must struggle against the provisional government at all costs, that you must raise high the banner of all power to the Soviets, and he did that against tremendous obstacles uh, because most of the Bolsheviks were riveted to that orthodox theory of stages, and many of them, like Kamenev and Rykov, thought that there was still a lot of mileage left in that period of bourgeois democracy to improve the lot of the working class, and what Lenin did was to cut the ties very decisively uh, between the Bolshevik party and any class collaboration, or any collaboration with other socialist parties that were willing to support uh, this bourgeois democracy. And what remains to be demonstrated is simply the lost act. Namely, the capacity of Lenin in those critical months of September and October of 1917 to impose upon a party that was very reluctant uh, to accept that lie, to impose upon the party the idea that an armed insurrection was both necessary and possible in the fall of 1917, and secondly, to galvanize that party into action uh, so that it prepared and finally carried through uh, that particular armed insurrection. Now you must understand that the seven weeks that passed for what we call the Kornilov push, in other words, the effort of a coup d'etat of the right uh, that occurred at the end of August of 1917, uh, from that Kornilov push uh, to the Bolshevik uprising of the 25th and 26th of October, seven weeks passed, which the Russians called the Kerenshchina. In other words, the seven weeks in which Kerensky, who is the key person in the provisional government, really presides over its decomposition, in which Russian society uh, basically decomposes. It really is very
very difficult to describe this to you. Uh, Trotsky has said it so very much better in his great history of the Russian Revolution. Uh, but just think, you see, that from revolt you are going to chaos. Uh, that in the cities, in September and in October, uh, there is terrific street action, which is really pillaging, which is rioting, which becomes very headless and very formless. In Tashkent, for example, on the 1st of September of 1917, simply rioters from the street dispossessed the local Soviet, saying it was much too moderate, and established a revolutionary provisional committee. Or in the cities of Kharkov, or the city of Rostov, in the middle of September, you find workers who are half famished, who are on the street simply pillaging the shops, simply rioting very randomly. And that pattern is even more indelibly imposed upon the countryside, uh, because the poor peasants uh, begin a round of terrific pillaging of grains and other stocks that are held by either the landlords or the richer peasants. And they begin to burn manor houses, and they begin to dispossess the great landlords, and even at times to kill them, and of course they seize land. And what you have by the beginning of October is that in 624 districts of what constitutes old Russia, that there are peasant revolts or riots in 484 of them, and that it is even more extensive in Siberia. Now it is a pertinent question as to what this means about the political consciousness of the peasantry. Probably not very much. That what it was was a drive toward land, not the kind of political consciousness that said we want specifically either a socialist regime or we want another kind of government. But having said that, let me point out that a circumstantial alliance with the Bolsheviks was really being formed. That even though the old social revolutionaries had mainly a political grip upon the countryside traditionally, that more and more the peasants began to hear this word Bolshevik and to equate it with the idea of the breakup of these big estates and the redistribution of land. So that it is Victor Serge, for example, in his marvelous little book called The Year One of the Revolution, who tells us about a peasant meeting in a village outside the city of Tver at the end of September of 1917. And there's a social revolutionary who goes to the peasants and he says, don't listen to the Bolsheviks. They are defeatists. They are traitors to the country. Uh, they want to give our beautiful army over to the Germans. And besides that, they are plunderers. They don't respect, after all, the rights of private property. And the peasants interrupt this speaker, and they say, enough of you. What are you going to do about the land? Bring us a Bolshevik. <laughs> and consequently, you begin to get, you see, of that alliance of circumstance. And you do in the army also. What is the Russian army in September and October of 1917? It's a huge band of wanderers, men who are deserting in tremendous numbers. They're men who have nothing to eat in the army, who have no shoes to go on the feet, who begin to wander back to the villages, who lead some of these insurrections of the peasants, who wander about the cities. Again, Victor Serge, who tells us that in the city of Moscow, in the middle of September, uh, there were soldiers who had openly deserted, who were parading down the main streets of Moscow with placards that were saying, we will die on the barricades, but never on the fighting fronts. And against this, the provisional government is a history of pathos, a history of tragedy, and mainly a history of farce. Because you have a Kerensky who moves increasingly into the camp of counter-revolution that he's used at a time when the class struggle is so deep that it is at the point of no return. You cannot turn the clock back. Kerensky is insisting upon coalition, by which we mean class collaboration. And more than that, that he is putting the key positions in his ministry in the hands of very reactionary bourgeois. There is that foreign minister, Tereschenko, who goes to Buchanan, the British ambassador, right on the eve of the October Revolution, and this Tereschenko says the only thing that will save Russia is a counter-revolution. Uh, the 
by deputy, the one who is mainly in charge. While Kerensky was off on the front, haranguing the soldiers uselessly, the vice premier was a great industrialist who had threatened his workers with closing down the factory because they were getting out of hand, and consequently the provisional government preaches nothing but discipline and sacrifice to starving masses of people. But you see, the moderate socialists were no better. Granted that they finally lost control of the Soviet in Moscow by the 5th of September to the Bolsheviks, that they lost control of the Soviet of Petrograd by the 9th of September, but they still control the Central Executive Committee of the Congress of Soviets, because that first Congress had been held in June when the Social Revolutionaries and the Mensheviks were a majority. There was supposed to be a second Congress to convene on the 15th of October. They kept trying to put it off, afraid that the Bolsheviks would now be in control, but they used that leverage, you see, within the framework of that executive committee of the All-Russian Congress of Soviets to collaborate fully uh, with the provisional government, uh, to insist uh, that the demands that the popular classes were making uh, could not be met in those particular circumstances. So you get Opera Booth, uh, that the only thing uh, that the government does in this period of the Kerensh Chino is to call a kind of bogus organization called the Democratic Conference, uh, which is convened together on the 14th of September. And that really is to be an estate general, uh, the kind of estate general that the French called together in May of 1789. But remember uh, that the French estate general of May of 89 was the beginning of the revolution. If this had been done in February, it was one thing. But here in September, to call together 1,500 representatives of the left and of the right, of capital and labor, uh, to say that you can really resolve uh, these tremendous contradictions of Russian society by class collaboration, ludicrous. Now the Bolsheviks, since Lenin was in hiding in Finland, uh, the Bolsheviks decided to participate in this democratic conference, and they sent 66 representatives out of these 1,500. But the question arose of whether they would participate in what was to be called the Provisional Council of the Republic or the Pre-Parliament. Because out of these 1,500, uh, there were 550 elected who were to sit from the 7th of October as a kind of pre-parliament to prove uh, that Russia could really be a bourgeois parliamentary republic, uh, to make that constituent assembly a little bit closer, a little bit more of a reality. Now, Lenin was out of his skull when he thought that the Bolsheviks were going to participate in this pre-parliament. And consequently, he writes from his exile in Finland a very decisive note. And Lenin is not kidding about boycotting this pre-parliament. Pre-parliament, class collaboration, when the Bolsheviks ought to be out forming an insurrection and making their alliance with the masses very clear. And so he writes to the Central Committee of the Bolshevik Party on the 23rd of September, we must boycott the pre-parliament. We must leave it and go to the Soviet of workers, soldiers, and peasants' deputies, to the trade unions, to the masses in general. We must call on them to struggle. We must give them a clear and correct slogan. Disperse the Bonapartist gang of Kerensky and his fake pre-parliament with this Tseretelli Duma. The Mensheviks and social revolutionaries, even after the Kornilov revolt, refused to accept our compromise of peacefully transferring the power of us to the Soviet they have again sunk into the morass of filthy and mean bargaining with the cadets, down with the Mensheviks and social revolutionaries struggle against them ruthlessly. Uh, but in the Central Committee, and again in a Bolshevik conference, uh, the Bolsheviks decided that they would go into this pre-parliament anyway and see if possibly they didn't have a place, a forum, by which to reach the mass again. And so it opened on the 7th of October, 500 150, mind you, uh, just three weeks before the whole thing finishes, 
and of those 550, 247 belong to the right, belong to the bourgeoisie. Only 302 are belong, after all, to the parties of the left. The Bolsheviks have 66. Trotsky looks all of that over and decides it's perfectly useless and consequently leaves the parade of Bolsheviks out of this free parliament with this statement. We, the Bolshevik fraction of the Social Democratic Party, announce that we have nothing in common with this government of treason to the people and with this council of counter-revolutionary connivance. We refuse to shield it either directly or indirectly for a single day and out the Bolsheviks walk, which means that this pre-parliament becomes a ludicrous, ridiculous shadow. Uh, the one party that really has its hand on the pulse of the nation no longer participates in it. Suhanov is magnificent. He said that that pre-parliament made the wartime Duma under Rasputin's iron heel look like a grand, great historic parliament. <laughs> and all that while, the Bolsheviks were going to the heights of the revolutionary movement. They were winning over peasants because of the land question. They were winning over regiment after regiment of the army on the peace question. They surely had the sailors, the Baltic fleet sailors, met in a congress in the first days of October and pledged their allegiance to the Bolsheviks, sent a message to Kerensky, addressed to Napoleon Kerensky, traitor of the revolution, we send you our worst curses. <laughs> Obviously, there is a kind of map groundswell. And certainly, the high point of this is the Bolshevik conquest of the two leading Soviets and of a whole spate of others. Because it is on the 5th of September of 1917 that the Bolsheviks become a majority in the Moscow Soviet. You see, the factory committees began to recall their deputies and began to send others much more radical and consequently on that 5th of September a vote was taken of no confidence in the provisional government and passing power to the Soviets and it passed 325 to 250 which meant that the Bolsheviks controlled the Moscow Soviet. After that uh, they controlled the Baku Soviet, uh, they controlled the Kharkov Soviet. Finally on the 9th of September it was Petrograd because the same motion of no confidence in the provisional government was put and it passed 519 to 414 which meant that the Bolsheviks controlled that. They elected the presiding officer. It was Trotsky, the same Trotsky who had been the presiding officer 12 years earlier in that St. Petersburg Soviet of 1905. Lenin didn't care really about the Soviet. That is to say, the Soviets, after all, had been part and parcel of a strategic line for months of that February Revolution. He saw, after all, in the Soviets and in the possibility of Bolshevik majorities in the Soviets, the chance to go peacefully to power. In other words, to carry the Bolshevik party peacefully to power. But July days had changed him. In July, it was perfectly demonstrable that there would be no going to power without force without violence, uh, because the repressive force of the bourgeoisie and the collaboration in that of the moderate socialists was perfectly clear. At that time, on the 29th of July, Lenin wrote off and dismissed the Soviets. He said the Soviets are zeros, marionette, marionettes. Real power doesn't belong to them, it resides in the genuine mass. But now in September, that the Bolsheviks were in the majority in these important Soviets, they became important to Lenin again. Uh, because if the Bolsheviks took power, and you had the second All-Russian Congress of Soviets meeting simultaneously, you could get the imprint of those Soviets. In other words, that the Bolshevik taking of power would have literally, in a formal way, the imprint of mass approval. And consequently, in that context, as that All-Russian Congress of Soviets was to meet sometime in October, Lenin began to think that what was all important to 
prevent chaos, to prevent that chaos from leading to counter-revolution, to prevent the Germans from taking the city of Petrograd. Everything converged at the point of making an armed insurrection. But you have militants in that Bolshevik party who remember very well for whom it is still fresh in the mind that they had been almost clobbered to death after the July demonstrations, that they had called those July demonstrations, that they had been premature, but they had been blamed on the Bolsheviks, and the party was almost destroyed. And consequently, as late as the 30th of August of 1917, you have Zinoviev writing in the Pravda, which is then under the editorship of Stalin, and you have him writing an article, What We Must Not Do, in which we read, Remember the fate of the Paris Commune. We Bolsheviks, the Bolsheviks must avoid any premature attempt to take power by force. And that was the primary attitude in the party. No idea of an armed insurrection at that point. Lenin, sitting in Finland, out of its skull, thinking that this was the moment, and if the moment passed, it might not, it might not come again. And so he began to write to the Central Committee. And you write, you know, and when Lenin writes to the Central Committee, it has to be read, obviously. And so he writes somewhere between the 12th and the 14th of September. These documents, which come in volume 26 of the Collected Works, which is one of the really fruitful volumes, and these documents are perfectly magnificent because you really do follow this horrendous struggle out of which, on which so much turned. And here is Lenin in that letter that he writes to the Central Committee sometime between the 14th and the, uh, and the, uh, uh, between the 12th and the 14th of September. And he lays it out this way. The Bolsheviks, having obtained a majority in the Soviets of workers and soldiers' deputies of both capitals, Moscow and Petrograd, can and must take state power into their hands. They can, because the active majority of revolutionary elements in the two chief cities is large enough to carry the people with it, to overcome the opponent's resistance, to smash him, and to gain power and retain power. Now listen, this is very important, because this is the stabilizing element of the revolution. This is what Lenin does to a T on the morrow of that taking of power. For the Bolsheviks, by immediately proposing a democratic peace, and then immediately giving the land to the peasants, and by re-establishing the democratic institutions of the Soviet, will form a government which nobody will be able to overthrow. No answer uh, to Lenin's document of the 12th of September. And so he writes again on the 16th of September. Now this is the creative and classic document, because this is the one in which Lenin lays out the art of insurrection. If you're going to get into this line of work, then quite obviously the art of insurrection becomes important. To be successful, he writes to the Central Committee, instructing them in something really that they hadn't considered. To be successful, insurrection must rely not upon conspiracy and not upon a party, but upon the advanced class. Point one, that you really do have to have the mass support of the proletariat. And that the Bolsheviks certainly had through the factory committees, through their control of the cities. Point two, the insurrection must rely upon a revolutionary upsurge of the people. That you certainly had. You had all of this tremendous volatility, this intensifying class struggle. That is the second point. Then insurrection must rely upon that turning point in the history of the growing revolution when the activity of the advanced ranks of the people is at its height and when the vacillation in the ranks of the enemy and in the ranks of the weak, half-hearted, and irresolute friends of the revolution are strongest. And that you certainly have. That provisional government was irresolute, and certainly the Mensheviks and the social revolutionaries were. Then he goes on to say that you are worried about July days, about the fact that we were almost clobbered in July days. And he says that was very different. On the 3rd and 4th of July, it could have been argued without violating the truth. 
that the correct thing to do was to try to take power, since our enemies would in any case have accused us of insurrection and ruthlessly treated us as rebels. However, to have decided on this account in favor of taking power at that time would have been wrong. It would have been wrong, said Lenin, because the control over the working class, the authority over the working class, was not clear. There had not been a Bolshevik majority in the Petrograd and Moscow Soviets. The Kornilov coup hadn't been tried. There hadn't been the obvious threat of a counter-revolution. Now it was all different. Now there was no reason to hesitate. And Lenin goes on at the very end to say, uh, in terms of the imperative of that, that if there is hesitation, there may be a historic moment lost forever. That letter was received by the Central Committee, and on Bukharin's word, it is the only document the Central Committee of the Bolshevik Party ever received from Lenin that it burned. And he burned the document at once, thinking it mad, thinking it crazy, and thinking it very dangerous if it should ever get into the hands of the police. At that point, uh, Lenin, of course, decided he would have to use blackmail. And consequently, he wrote on the 29th of September, in which he indicated, you are not answering my letters. And the things that I write to the Pravda are not getting into the newspaper. There's only one thing that I can do. In view of the fact that the Central Committee has left unanswered the persistent demands I have been making for such a policy ever since the beginning of the Democratic Conference, and since all of my articles in the Pravda have been deleted or have been, uh, 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 or have been uh, uh, reduced in size, I am compelled to regard this as a subtle hint at the unwillingness of the Central Committee <laughs> even to consider this question. A subtle hint that I should keep my mouth shut and as a proposal for me to retire. I am compelled, therefore, to tender my resignation uh, from the Central Committee, which I hereby do, reserving for myself freedom to campaign among the rank and file of the party and at the party congress. Now, I can't believe that Lenin thought that they were really going to accept uh, that resignation. Uh, they didn't, of course, and they said, Ilyich, what you must do is come and see us personally uh, so that we make sure that you haven't gone off your rocker. And what they suggested was that he come back to Petrograd in disguise and come to the Central Party Committee, uh, which would be held on the 10th of October. So Lenin shaved off his beard and put on a wig and put on big eyeglasses, which he never wore, and consequently in disguise went back to Petrograd on the 9th of October, appeared at the Central Party, uh, the Central Committee meeting of the 10th of October, and argued his case very vehemently. He said, now is the time. There will be a missed moment if you don't prepare for this insurrection now. The opposition was vehement from Zinoviev and from Kamenev. And finally, when the resolution was put to prepare an insurrection, to commit the Bolshevik party to an insurrection, it was passed by a vote of 10 to 2, uh, that Zinoviev and Kamenev voted against it. And so much was still this an open question, that the next day, on the 11th of October, those two Zinoviev and Kamenev sent out a joint letter that went to the party committee in Petrograd, in Moscow, in Finland, that went to the factory committees, and that said, this really is madness, that what it will do to call for insurrection at this stage is not only playing with the future of our party and the revolution, but also that of the world revolution. What they proposed was that the Bolsheviks wait for the convocation of a constituent assembly in which, said Zinoviev and Kamenev, they would get more than a third of the seats and consequently the peaceful passage to power uh, might be possible. Consequently, a second Central Party Committee meeting was held that on the 16th of October, a little bit larger. Now there were 25 rather than 12 because they invited representatives of the factory committees and so forth. Again, Lenin argued his case by a vote of 19 to 2 with four abstentions, that was passed again, but Lenin made one concession. 
and it was the concession that Trotsky had been demanding, and that was that the timing of the insurrection should be the opening meeting on the 25th of October of the second All-Russian Congress of Soviets, in which the Bolsheviks would have a majority so that they could put their stamp of approval upon this insurrection. That didn't satisfy Zinoviev and Kamenev, and they did what really flipped Lenin out. They went on the 18th of October to a non-party newspaper, the newspaper of Novaya Zhen, of Maxim Gorky, who was not a Bolshevik and was really close to the Mensheviks, and they wrote an article in which they revealed the secret of that the Bolsheviks were preparing an insurrection and they were opposed to it. Well, Lenin was beside himself. And he immediately wrote to the Central Committee, they may be old comrades of mine, but that's strike-breaking, no matter which way you put it. And consequently, they must be expelled from the Central Committee and expelled from the party. The very interesting thing is that they were not expelled from the party, and that only Kamenev was expelled from the Central Committee by a vote of five to four. And that the conciliation toward them was led at the Central Committee by Stalin, who was proved later to be, in some quarters, at any rate, not conciliatory. <laughs> and of course it raises the question of whether Stalin really was in favor of that armed insurrection at that particular time, still a question of some ambiguity. But the importance of the Zinoviev Kamenev thing is that they had to go outside the party to express themselves. In other words, that the party by that time really had been recaptured by Lenin. He had committed it to the idea that all of the elements were there the moment was right. And it's at that moment that the stage comes to be occupied by that most dramatic figure of Trotsky. Because Lenin, you see, built a party, and Lenin made a strategy, and Lenin turned that party to the need for insurrection at the proper moment, but Lenin was not the great agitator, Lenin was not the great dramatist, Lenin was not the great actor, as Sukhanov says, and it is suddenly in those few days before that October <coughs> insurrection that Trotsky is everywhere. And it is a great orator, you know, and it is somebody whose voice really is the voice of the Elan, of the enthusiasm, of the fury of the mass. And consequently, he goes from meeting to meeting to generate that enthusiasm for the insurrection. In addition to which, Trotsky has the organization for the insurrection. He is president of the Petrograd Soviet that is now in Bolshevik hands. And from the 9th of October, there is what is called the, the Revolutionary Military Committee. Uh, that Revolutionary Military Committee had been established on the 9th of October to arm the workers against a possible invasion of Petrograd by the Germans. And consequently, the Red Guard, which had existed from the beginning of the February Revolution, but became more and more a major armed working class force, the Red Guard began to be turned into a very solid phalanx of armed workers, probably 25,000 of them in Petrograd on the very eve of that insurrection of the 25th and the 26th. And consequently, with that organization, all you needed was ideological training, and that came through the Bolshevik party, through the factory committees, and the Bolshevik hands. By the time you come to the week of the 22nd of October of 1917, there is a will for this insurrection in the city of Petrograd. And the insurrection itself of the 25th and 26th of October you know, I who have lived my life with those great days, for example, of the 14th of July of 1789, and can recognize a grand journée when I see one. And there is something rather disappointing about the 25th and 26th of October. It has none of that grandeur, you know, that the taking of the Bastille by 953 workers had in 1789. And the reason is perfectly obvious. On the day, the 26th of October, when the provisional government government falls, and when the Winter Palace is taken, there are no great street processions, there are no great manifestations, there are five casualties in the taking of the Winter Palace is all, because the whole shell was all that was left, that it was rotted inside, that there was no opposition, it just 
popped. <laughs> and you see, that gave some people the idea that it really was a coup d'etat, that it really was a kind of a conspiracy by the Bolsheviks. And there's a marvelous guy named Jacques Sadoul, who later became an important member of the French Communist Party, and who at that time was in the French military delegation to Russia. And Jacques Sadoul, who wrote back to Albert Thomas, he said, don't be deluded. This is not a coup d'etat. The reason there is no opposition is because the popular masses are with this change, with the fall of the provisional government. And it is Sukhanov who tells us much the same thing, because Sukhanov says, to call the October Revolution a military conspiracy rather than a national uprising is utterly absurd, since the Bolsheviks at that moment had the broad support of the popular classes. They already were the de facto rulers of Russia. And so it begins with a provocation on the 23rd of October. It is a provocation of a provisional government. It suddenly lurches a little bit, and it shuts down the Bolshevik press with a few loyalist troops, and it shuts down the Bolshevik printing plant. The 24th, the Revolutionary Military Committee of the Soviet, directed by Trotsky, goes and reopens the Bolshevik newspaper, reopens the Bolshevik press, and consequently issues an order to all of the detachments of the Russian army in Petrograd to be ready for a coup d'etat from the right which is being planned by Kerensky and the provisional government and consequently on the 25th in the earliest morning hours the plan for the insurrection goes into effect. 2 a.m. the postal system is occupied. 3 a.m. the telegraph center. By 7 a.m. of the 25th of October all of the railway stations are taken by 10 a.m. of the 25th comes this document, this manifesto from the Revolutionary Military Committee. The provisional government is deposed. All state authority has passed into the hands of the Revolutionary Military Committee, organ of the Petrograd Soviet, acting in the name of the proletariat, long live the revolution of workers, soldiers, and peasants. It remained only to take the Winter Palace, where the ministers of the old government Government, where the ministers of the provisional government were hiding out, still meeting. Kerensky escaped. He got out of the Winter Palace and immediately went to refuge, where do you suppose? At once to the American Embassy. And there, in an automobile with an American flag, he got out of the city to the north to try to rally commanders to march upon Petrograd and to unseat this revolution, all of which petered out within five days. But it still took an armed force to penetrate that Winter Palace and to find those particular ministers. By 7 in the evening of the 25th of October, the Kronstadt sailors arrive, having come down the Neva River and arriving in Petrograd. By 10, they had joined with armed Red Guard and under the leadership of Antonov of Sienko, entered into the Winter Palace. Well, there, there really was no fighting. Those who were defending simply fraternized and then, from about midnight until 2 a.m., the problem was to find the provisional government because it's a palace of 400 rooms. <laughs> they wandered through all of these immense corridors looking for the ministers. We finally found them at 10 minutes after 2 on the morning of the 26th of October. By that time, by midnight, at the turn of the 26th of October, the second All-Russian Congress of Soviets had gathered and had opened its sessions. By 2.30, Kamenev reports to that particular Congress that yes, the provisional government has fallen and the ministers have been taken prisoner and put in Peter Paul Fortress and all power now passes to the Soviets. There was acclamation, there was pandemonium. But those who were the social revolutionaries and those who were the Mensheviks couldn't take it and consequently they got up to walk out. And poor Yuri Markov, because Markov is a good man and a very good militant and someone who deserved a lot better in history than he ever got, but who was somebody caught up in a party that was literally impossible. And consequently, Martov rushed to the podium and he said, as the social revolutionaries and Mensheviks were walking out, he said, for heaven's sakes, you Bolsheviks, do something to compromise. Do something to make a coalition 
Russian government. Keep the socialists together. That's crucially important. And of course, it brought Trotsky into action. And Trotsky at this time was really living on speed and consequently moved into that central podium <laughs> at this point. And with all of that sarcasm and with all of that kind of vitriol that this man could conjure up, that he really conjured up out of the bile. And consequently, Trotsky made what really is one of the great responses in the whole litany of revolutionary literature. The masses of the people have followed our banner, and our insurrection is victorious. And now we are told, renounce your victory, make concessions, compromise, and with whom? With the wretched groups who have left us? Should those millions of workers and peasants represented in this Congress make a compromise as between equals with men who are ready, not for the first time, to leave us to the mercy of the bourgeoisie? No, here no compromise is possible. To those who have left and to those who suggested to us, we must say, you are miserable bankrupts. Your role is over, so where you ought to be, go where you ought to be, into the garbage heap of history. <laughs> and so it was that there was a rupture that was profound. At nine o'clock that next morning, it is Lenin who appears to a kind of pandemonium and comes in to read off the list of people's commissars who will form the government. All of them Bolsheviks, Lenin the head of the government, Trotsky at, foreign, at the foreign ministry, Lunacharsky at education, Stalin at nationalities, Ostenko at war, and uh, of all of this, Shlyapnikov uh, uh, at labor, all of this, a uniform Bolshevik government approved overwhelmingly, and then Lenin says, and now we proceed to construct socialism. Well, what this 47-year-old man was thinking when he said that to a Congress is I leave to your psychological imagination. It suffices to say that neither quantitatively, in terms of what was there, nor qualitatively, in terms even of what they had in mind, were they going to begin to construct socialism. But this much is true, that this October insurrection is the very first effort in history, with the exception of the Paris Commune, which attempted to establish another order on the self-conscious principle of the rule of the working class. And the Bolshevik party represented that ideal, and the proletariat at that moment became the dominant class in Russian history. And then it was to Lenin's great tactical genius that was left the task of stabilizing it. And he did it just as he said he would. That very first meeting, two decrees, a land decree that all the land of the biggest states, of the church, of the state, were to be nationalized and to be turned over to peasant committees to be redistributed to the poor peasantry. And that won the peasant. And then a peace decree, a decree that was directed to the peoples and governments of the belligerent countries. Uh, the idea being that the belligerent governments would turn down uh, this plea for a democratic immediate peace without annexations, but that the peoples of the belligerent countries, when they saw that their governments would turn it down, would overthrow their governments. And so it was that this government of the Bolsheviks immediately published the Tsarist archives, in other words, those secret treaties that showed that all of the Allies had imperialistic aims. And yet there was no revolution in the West, and peace was the sine qua non of staying in power. And so it was that the Russians made an armistice with Germany on the 2nd of December, and on the 22nd of December went to Brest-Litovsk, to begin peace negotiations. And by the 5th of January of 1918, the terms that the Germans imposed were so draconian that would have stripped not only Finland, but the Baltic countries and Poland and white Russia from Russia, that there was a terrific struggle inside the Bolshevik party as to whether to pursue these peace talks or not. 
and that struggle centered around three positions. The position of Lenin, that yes, we must have peace with the Germans, even if it is only a beachhead that is left, because if we continue this war a moment longer, the German army will overrun Petrograd and what the hell will be left? And Trotsky's position of neither peace nor war to go great throat that he was to Brest Litovsk and talk and talk to the West, talk over the heads of those German negotiators and urge those Western proletariats to make a revolution or possibly to urge the Allied governments to send enough help to Russia so that she could continue the war against an aggressive German imperialism. And then a left-wing position headed by Bukharin, a revolutionary defense of the country that let us arm all of the people, let us have that revolutionary defense. Oh, left-wing demagoguery, says Lenin. The people don't have it left. They are really exhausted. And so it is on the 5th of January that Trotsky's position wins 9 to 7. They continue the negotiations, and the Germans ask more. They continue their penetration of Russia, and by then the Ukraine also is added to their list. By the time the terms of the Peace of Brest-Litovsk are hammered out, the Russians will have lost 26% of their population, 27% of their arable land, and 75% of all of their iron and steel. And Lenin said, you've got to accept that. And the 3rd of March of 1918, the Peace of Brest-Litovsk was signed. And why not in Lenin's terms? You have that beachhead and you know there will be a revolution in Germany and you will get it back. And so it was that Lenin knew how to curb the excesses of that party to adapt it to its particular need of insurrection, to stabilize it for the moment, oh, key. And yet, there is in that Leninist project risk and conception, which I think we have to question. Risk, certainly. Risk with the peasantry. Rosa Luxemburg spelled that out in that text on the Russian Revolution very well. Rosa said, you are messing around with an individual landholding peasantry, and what will that do to your revolution? The seizure of the land and estates by the peasant, according to the short and precise slogan of Lenin and his friends, go and take the land for yourself, simply led to the sudden chaotic conversion of large land ownership into peasant land ownership. What was created is not social property, but a new form of private property, namely the breaking up of large estates into medium and small ones, or relatively large advanced units of production into primitive small units which operated with technical means from the time of the pharaohs. Nor is that all. Through these measures and their chaotic and purely arbitrary manner of execution, differentiation in landed property far from being eliminated was even further sharpened. Although the Bolsheviks called upon the peasantry to form peasant committees so that the seizure of the nobles' estate might in some fashion be made into a collective act, yet it is clear that this general advice could not change anything in the real practice and real relationships of power on the land. In other words, what Rose is saying is that the richer peasants got most of that land in the distribution. That you create private land holding, uh, that you buttress that Kulak class, a contradiction, a profound contradiction. What happens when you want to collectivize the land, as Lenin says from the beginning, is the goal. Will you then not have to clobber the peasantry? Will you then not have to introduce that bureaucratic machine which becomes so oppressive within the Soviet structure. Risk number one. Risk number two, that European revolution. Now about that we'll talk at length, but with that European revolution there is a corollary, and is it ever considered? And the corollary is that the capitalist governments will be so threatened and so enraged that they will intervene against this new regime that they will not only be able to curb the revolutionary currents in their own countries, but have resources left over to try to clobber the Soviet regime. Is that an unrealistic view? Not if you consider, for example, the policymakers in your own State Department in 1917. There is Robert Lansing looking at this thing and hearing Ambassador Francis from Petrograd saying, that he is openly encouraging the Russians to overthrow this menace 
which has taken Russia out of the war and which threatens the whole order of private property. And so here is Lansing presenting a policy statement to President Wilson on the 7th of December of 1917, which President Wilson thought was a number one. And so Lansing writes, the Bolsheviks lack international virtue. That's such an American statement. The Bolsheviks lack international virtue. They are trying to make the ignorant and incapable mass of humanity dominant on the earth. We must then hope for and encourage a strong commanding personality to arise, to restore order and to maintain a government which can bring Russia into a sane post-revolutionary era. Risk number two, and then conception. What happened to those Soviets? If the conception is the proletarian state, if the conception is the economic state, if it is the idea that this great collective mass production machine of capitalism is to be put to the service of the mass of proletarians, that they are to become its employees, what then happens to the creativity, to the originality, to the association out of which a whole other creative revolution comes? Let's not underestimate what the Russians did vis-a-vis -vis family, vis-a-vis -vis marriage. All of that was legalistic and very important. That divorce became possible almost at once on the consent of either partner. Uh, that marriage was a civil affair. Uh, that women had the right to choose freely. Uh, that there were collective creche or, or nurseries that were established in order to take care of children. All that's built in. But the family institution itself, not question. The institution, for example, of uh, marriage itself, which Bukharin and Kolantan subject to certain kinds of inspection in the early years of the 1920s. No, no. The point is that the entire disciplinary machinery of an older society gets built into the idea of this economic state. Because once you equate the quantity of production the necessity, after all, of establishing that infrastructure of quantity, that infrastructure of production, as the basis of this society, then so much that might creatively have begun to replace that conception of sheer quantity really must be subordinated. It's a problem of conception within which, after all, the state becomes important again, the Soviet disappears as a viable institution, the Cheka or the police, the bureaucracy, they've got to intervene in order to accomplish this transfer of this state machinery into the hands that will use it, presumably, for the good of the public. I yield to no one in my admiration for that work of Lenin, and nobody is more troubled by the ambiguities of that project. Thank you.